Good morning, church family. It is certainly good to be with you again on the first day of the week to worship God in spirit and in truth and hope you're doing that and glorifying him in, in doing so. Uh, even if it's in circumstances that uh, are not ideal, we hope that very soon we'll be back collectively, congregationally, worshiping God together. We are so grateful to God that he's given us this avenue to worship him even when we can't be together, which uh, I certainly believe is a biblical principle that we should utilize, but God's ideal is that we come together. So I hope no one is getting too comfortable in worshiping God uh, in this way, that we will look forward to that great reunion day. You know, when we, when we think about and are focusing on being back together, I'm reminded of some of the great old hymns that we sing what a gathering that will be uh, at the sounding of the trumpet when God's saints are gathered home and we will see the glory of Christ and we will be with him throughout eternity. And what a gathering that will be. We're thinking about if the Lord grants us more time on this earth to be back together um, at the church building and what a reunion, what a gathering that is going to be. And that's why last uh, Lord's Day, I asked you for... Uh, suggestions on what might occur on that day and what what all we might do and I'm I'm thankful for those that have uh, responded many of them some uh, a little bit on the humorous side some are more serious and I want to share these with the elders and perhaps uh, we can implement some of these we probably won't be able to implement them all I'm sure we won't be able to implement them all but hopefully we will get a good sample of how you think that reunion day should be, and what a what a great grand day that that will be. And speaking about responses, I want to share with you just a couple of uh, of calls that I've had, conversations that I've had with uh, people in the congregation. I received one uh, just a few moments ago before recording this lesson, and uh, the the statement question went something like this, Matt. We, we can see um, your attire from the waist up when you're recording these lessons, but what about from the waist down? And I, I told this fellow that, um, listen, what takes place in one's bedroom, some of those things need to be kept secret. And so we'll just leave that there. Uh, another conversation that I had with, uh, with Hoyt Penland. Love Hoyt and Barbara very much. And uh, Hoyt was saying, Matt, he said, this, this thing has got to get over soon. I've, we, we've got to be back together. We've got to get out of this isolation or, or Barbara is, is, is going to go crazy. He said, uh, he said I'm going to need your services. I said, oh, yeah? I said, you mean I'm going to have to... Uh, have to do some marital counseling here? He said, marital counseling, ha. Huh? He said, I mean preaching my funeral. So, I mean, different con conversations like this just draw us together. And uh, it is so good to, uh, to be able to converse with you, even in isolation. And I hope that, uh, again, that this uh, will soon pass. We will be back together and we'll be able to enjoy uh, sermons and discussions about what we've learned from this time, the blessings that, uh, that, that God has brought into our lives, and I know there are many. Another thing that I need to mention, I feel like a meteorologist. Uh, last week, you recall, uh, Keith Taylor, who is our National Weather Service storm spotter, uh, made us aware early of the storms that passed through our area last uh, last Sunday evening, and I'm glad he did that. Uh, that was a great help to me because one of those storms passed through Hobgood Park, and I live just a stone's throw from Hobgood Park, and I was glad to uh, for that alert. And Keith tells me again that there are more storms coming through this evening into Monday evening, but the thinking right now is that those storms won't be as severe as the ones last last week, but thunderstorms nonetheless, and a possible tornado. So we need to make sure we keep tuned into our local TV and radio stations for uh, updates on on the storm. I want to uh, 
ask you to keep praying for Brinley Kennedy, uh, the newborn baby of uh, Kevin and Michaela Kennedy. Uh, most of you know that on Friday evening at five o'clock, uh, Brinley had a seizure, and uh, because of so many of the antibiotics that she was receiving and didn't know at the time that she had sepsis, which is always a, a, a dangerous situation, uh, she had a seizure, but she underwent uh, an EEG throughout uh, Friday evening, and there was no further signs of seizure activities, and we're grateful to God for that. She is now off oxygen. She's eating through her NG, uh, NG tube, and we are just grateful that things are, are progressing the, the way they are. Continue to pray for... Uh, for Kevin and Michaela and Brindley, this good family, as they are facing a, a very difficult uh, challenge, uh, even through this time of isolation. You know, only one parent can be with the child. Uh, the other one is not allowed in the hospital. So there are, are many things about which we need to pray and, uh, and glorify God as we see things improving in, in their situation. Before we get into the crux of the lesson, I want to read a passage of scripture from Leviticus chapter 11, which I find uh, uh, interesting. Given the concerns we have with the coronavirus and particularly as it pertains to theories of its origin, we have heard uh, many times on news reports and in discussion with others the idea of the role that bats have played in the origin of this virus. You know, it's very interesting to me how the Lord uh, indicated to the children of Israel what were clean animals, what were unclean, what animals were an abomination to him. Yes, even though he created them, uh, which uh, animals they were to eat and not to eat. Well, did you know that in Leviticus chapter 11, there's a mention of bats? Yeah, I can't imagine that anyone, anywhere, at any time, would want to eat a bat. But I'm seeing this more and more. We're seeing it through social media. And uh, there are those in China that have gone into bat caves uh, that have tried to come up with a solution to this problem and retrieving things for laboratory studies. And it's interesting what the Lord has said beginning at verse 13 of Leviticus 11. And these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. He had talked about uh, the fish life and, and, and other areas uh, of, of life, of, of what should be eaten, what should be not eaten. And here among the birds, the Lord says, these shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. Now watch this, the eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite and the falcon after its kind, every raven after its kind. Now all Pittsburgh Steeler fans understand exactly why all kinds of ravens would be an abomination to the Lord. But he goes on to say the ostrich and the short-eared owl the seagull and the hawk after its kind. And it's interesting, the different kinds of owls that are mentioned. I wasn't aware of all these different kinds. Not only uh, the short-eared owl, but the little owl, the fisher owl, and the screech owl, and the white owl. God is very specific in these things. Uh, some of these animals that we don't commonly hear of, the jackadaw and the carrion vulture. Uh, here's one, the stork. The stork, so if, uh, if those who are getting ready to have a child, if the stork shows up at your front door, the stork is an abomination to the Lord. Uh, the heron after its kind, the hoopoe, uh, not hippo, but a hoopoe. And then at the end of verse 19, the Bible says, and the bat. The bat was an abomination. I wonder if we had... Uh, Many people back in that day that wanted to avail themselves to, uh, to eat these kind of creatures, I certainly hope not, but God had a reason for mentioning these. Now, we know that everything that God mentions is an abomination to him, 
was not necessarily for all time and men were not to eat any of these things, uh, for, uh, pork, for example. But God knew until certain things were developed and certain ideas were were uh, engineered that there would be some foods that would not uh, work well uh, with the human body, in the human body. And so these things, uh, the children of Israel were commanded not to eat. But the bat was one of them. Just uh, an interesting tidbit there. I want to uh, talk to you this morning. I want us to consider a lesson today that I've entitled, It's All a Matter of Perspective. How many times did the Lord teach in his ministry uh, things that were not readily understood? They were misunderstood because of a lack of perspective on the part of the hearer. I mean, so many examples of this could be given. I'm thinking of the Jewish leaders. Do you remember when Jesus said on one occasion, hey, I'm going to tear down this temple and I'm going to build it again in three days? Well, depending on your perspective of different things, your perspective uh, of the Son of God, your perspective of the situation that he's talking about, you could come up with different ideas just based on that statement that the Lord said, uh, what he meant. If you were one of the religious leaders back in that day and the Lord said that in your hearing, what would be your perspective? What would you think he was talking about? You know, it is all a matter of perspective. Well, you know, these religious leaders thought, hey, the Lord is going to destroy our building from which we make our livelihood. In fact, uh, to support their charge of blasphemy when they were crucifying the Lord and they were yelling for the Romans to crucify him, no doubt this was on their mind because they said so. This man said that he was going to tear down the temple and build it in three days. That's not only blasphemous, that is impossible. But from the Christian perspective, we knew that the Lord was talking about his physical body was going to be crucified, and on the third day, on the parts of three days, he was going to be risen from the dead. It's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? How about all of the, oh, no, you're not, statements that, the, that Peter made in response to the Lord? Do you remember some of those? How about the, uh, the classic one, when the Lord told Peter he was going to wash his feet? Would Peter say, oh, no, Lord. Oh, no, no, Lord, that's not going to happen. And if you are going to wash my feet, wash the rest of my body. And the Lord had to correct him. But from Peter's perspective, he had a different idea of why the Lord was needing to do that. And sometimes our perspective comes from an ignorant standpoint, sometimes from a dishonest standpoint, sometimes from an innocent standpoint, but other... Uh, Thoughts may be going through our mind that we don't particularly pick up on the Lord's perspective. That's why it's so important to study the Word of God, so we can get His perspective on a matter. That's why we need to think and obey God rather than man. It's, it's more important to get the Lord's perspective. What about um, the Lord's perspective in telling Peter and the apostles that he was going to go to Jerusalem to be crucified? Oh, no, you're not. Don't you know they're going to take your life? And can't you just imagine what's going through the Lord's mind during these times? Oh, how long? In fact, he mentioned this on, on another occasion. How long am I going to have to put up with this? No, this is why I came to the world, to be crucified and give my life a ransom for many, to shed my blood for the remission of sins. But Peter, oh, no, you're not. You know, the Lord told Peter that Satan would desire him to sift him as wheat. And on one occasion, he told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You see, P Satan's perspective especially is not the Lord's perspective, but neither was Peter's many, many times. Uh, sometimes, though, their perspective was spot on, wasn't it? Remember the great confession that Peter made at Caesarea Philippi when Jesus said, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And uh, the apostles were telling the Lord who the people were saying he was, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. 
And then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter made the great confession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Well, when Jesus asked the apostles, who do you say that I am? Many responses could be given. You know, they could have said many things. They could have, they could have said, you are the carpenter's son. You are a carpenter. They could have said, you are a troublemaker. You have aroused plenty here in Judea with your truth. They could have said a lot of the things. They could have said, you are uh, a Nazarene born in Bethlehem, and on and on. Their perspective was the same as Peter stood up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Point being, no matter if it's a good thing, a bad thing, when it comes to our relationship with God and salvation, isn't it all a matter of perspective? The perspective, am I going to do exactly what God wants me to do to be saved? Or do I think that, you know, God is a loving, graceful, graceful, merciful God, and, you know, he's going to cut a little slack in this area? Is that the perspective that God wants? What about when we are suffering trials and temptations? We're going through isolation from a virus. Doesn't it get down to, again, it's a matter of perspective? Oh, it's our prayer that we have so understood God's perspective of things that we can be content in whatever situation we find ourselves that we can understand what faithfulness to God is all about during the good times, during the bad times, as we perceive those things. You know, when Jesus was speaking in parables, he tried to the very best of his ability to take simple earthly stories and draw from it a heavenly meaning so his audience could be in better perspective, could understand uh, things a little clearer. Many times the Lord was successful, but many times he wasn't. But it wasn't because the message was lacking. It was because of the perspective of the hearer, where he was coming from. Perhaps uh, baggage from uh, yesteryear. You know, sometimes we carry that baggage into the future, and because we've always heard it a certain way, because we've always done it a certain way, that sometimes that clouds the true perspective that God wants us to have. It's not always dishonesty, but sometimes it is, like in the case of the religious leaders of the days of Jesus, and like many religious leaders of our day and time. Do you suppose that there are any religious leaders that are preaching and teaching for the economic gain and for the uh, adherence that comes from many followers? Perhaps the uh, uh, message is changed or diluted just a little bit. In order for that to happen, remember how the church in Philippi started? Uh, we talked about it last Wednesday, how Paul and Silas were going into Macedonia, into Philippi, and, and they were preaching the gospel, and that demon-possessed girl was behind them saying, here, here comes Paul and Silas teaching in the name of the Lord. And then she would attach her fortune-telling to it, and it was through that means that the religious leaders uh, uh, with her were making their money. And when Paul and Silas cast out the demons and she stopped the soothsaying, uh, they, uh, they put Paul and Silas, the religious leaders, put Paul and Silas in prison and they couldn't get gain or make merchandise from the gospel. Do you suppose that there are any like that today? Like maybe the ones that say, come to a miraculous service and we will heal you. Just like uh, Jesus and and Peter raised people from the dead and how we can, you know, where, I would like to ask this question. Uh, where is Benny and Kenny now? Where is Benny Hinn and Kenny, Kenneth Copeland now? Why are they not performing their miracles now and healing all of these thousands that are dying from this coronavirus? Benny and Kenny, where are you? Where are all those that believe that biblical miracles happen today? Where are you? Boy, it'd be nice if they showed up. You don't see them going into the hospitals either, but they shouldn't uh, be contagious or fear of 
catching a contagion because, hey, it should be just like Jesus said to those that would be working miracles in the first century. Uh, before uh, that which is perfect, the completed word of God came, you can drink deadly poison and it, and it won't hurt you. Well, can't these uh, miracle workers enter the hospital and the virus won't contaminate them? Interesting thought, is it not? Well, uh, another question that was asked during the ministry of Christ, he says, remember to the religious leaders, the baptism of John, whence was it? Where did it come from? Did it come from heaven or men? Well, they didn't want to answer. They didn't want to be honest. They were dishonest from their perspective. It's all about perspective. And that's why the Lord asked them. He knew their hearts. Where did it come from, heaven or men? And they reasoned, well, if we say from men, then we fear the multitude because the multitude perceived their perspective was John was a prophet and that was a right perception. It was the Lord's perception. Should have been the religious leader's perception. But if we say from heaven, then the Lord will say, well, why didn't you do it? Well, that's an interesting uh, idea, even as we apply that today. You know, I, I, I have many times asked denominational preachers. I have asked uh, denominations, is it from heaven or from men? And, you know, some of them have concluded, and, and I could tell by their hesitation, hmm, and this is after we discussed for a while. If I say from heaven, then Matt's going to say, well, then where are they in the Bible? If we say from men, then I'm going to answer, well, why are, why are you in one? Because I wonder, as you apply this question to all denominational preachers, do they fear the people? Is that where they obtain their livelihood? Hmm. The more our perspective and what we mean by perspective is basically our outlook on things. The more that our perspective is like the Lord's, the more godly we are. The more that we glorify God when times are good, when times are not so good. And so we want to make sure that we keep perspective during our time of isolation. You know, this old country grandfather took his uh, grandson camping one day and his son was one or his grandson was one of the most educated men in all of the earth his grandson had six degrees and so they went camping and they went out and they set up their tent and uh they fell asleep well the grandfather woke up in the middle of the night and he woke up his grandson and he said uh hey Something's up here. Look up, and what do you see? And the grandson, knowing not exactly what his grandfather had in mind, said, well, I see millions of stars. And his grandfather says, yes, I know that, but uh, what about what you see? And he said, well, astronomically, those millions of stars tell me that there are just as many many millions of galaxies. He says, meteorologically, those stars tell me it's going to be a beautiful day tomorrow. He said, theologically, those stars tell me that, that God is amazing, that he is a great creator, and there is no way that this could have happened by accident through organic evolution or any other way. But then the educated grandson looked at his grandfather and says, well, what does this tell you? And the grandfather just shook his head and he said, this tells me that somebody stole our tent. It's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? And so it is with the situation in which we find ourselves. You know, we all go through disappointments and things that we don't understand. How many things of this life, it is just hard to comprehend. When we think of lifestyles, when we think of uh, uh, viruses and, and the medical field, different things, it's hard to comprehend some things. We just don't get it. The heartbreak of a child's decision. 
family relationships, marital relationships, why it all can't be as it needs to be, perhaps from our perspective or from the biblical perspective, uh, economic and health setbacks, uh, isolation issues from a virus. We don't understand all of this, and how we respond is a matter of perspective. Uh, perspective. In fact, the main struggle in this isolation setback is nobody understands everything about it, even though some think they know all about it. But the unknown is very uh, clear, if you will, in this situation. God's plan generally when we are in this situation is that we do know, that we know generally how to react. God is going to make us better after the heartbreak. After you go through the heartbreak, you're not going to look like you did during the heartbreak. He is going to make you better. And those who have lived much time at all on this earth know that. We know that when God brings us through the storm, our hair is not musty. We do not suffer the scars or we don't need to. And that's why we need to let the past go. God is wanting to make our perspective this. You are not going to look the way you did during the storm on the other side of it. Isn't that the great overall principle when we get to heaven? We're not going to look, we're not even going to have this body. We're not going to look or sound or, or feel anything like we do now. Isn't that a great thing? But what's our perspective? If our perspective is eternal, then that's how, how we look at that. If our perspective is earth laden, then it's all about the situation and all about getting excited about the earthly circumstance. Uh, in Romans 8, 28, we mention it a lot. For or and we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. But there are a couple things in this passage that we don't emphasize as much. Watch this. First of all, in the first part of that verse, Paul says, and we know. Usually we emphasize the part that all things work together for good, but we need to preface that with how Paul did. And we know, that's perspective. We know by perspective that God is going to take the things that we don't understand, the challenges, the hurts, the disappointments, the isolations in life, and he's going to make us better on the other side. Now watch verse 29. For whom he foreknew, the Father speaking of Jesus, he, he also predestined, he, us, then, to be conformed to Jesus. When? As we go through these things that we don't always understand that God is going to bring about from the bad to the good, from his perspective. We might not always see it that way. But we don't emphasize that part either from verse 29. But we need to, especially now. Remember as we're studying the book of Philippians, chapter 1 and verse 13, that Paul says, listen, my chains are in Christ. What did he mean? God is going to make me better after this time of being chained is over. I can't emphasize the chain only that I will glorify God in the chain. When Jesus was crucified and the Roman soldiers were at the foot of the cross, can't you imagine that great perspective difference? The great chasm between the perspective of the Lord and why he was being crucified and the perspective of the Roman soldiers of why he was being crucified. And what I want us to see in this lesson is the idea that there shouldn't be a great chasm in our perspective and in God's perspective, particularly as it relates to what we are experiencing. You know, you might be in the middle of a challenging issue, like Kevin and Michaela Kennedy are with Brindley, even during on top of this other challenging situation that we have and they have of being separated. Can you imagine being separated from your newborn child when its life is at stake? God uses these situations. Kevin and Michaela are going to come out stronger. We are going to come out stronger if we have the same perspective as God. 
It's not you being singled out. It's not necessarily because you've sinned or, you know, you have done anything. It's not necessarily that at all. It's a part of life. And it's, it's a part of God allowing these things to happen to advance our dependency upon him and to bring our perspective more like his. When we think of Joseph, right, being sold into slavery by his brothers who initially wanted to kill him. Well, when they finally had the great reunion, they were able to look back. And Joseph spoke according to God's perspective, which Joseph had through it all, and his brothers didn't have it at all. When Joseph said, you meant it for evil, Satan means it for evil, but God meant it for good. It's a different perspective of things. What's your perspective in your life? And in your present circumstance, how are you going to look at it? Are you going to look at it with godly glasses from a spiritual perspective or from Satan's glasses and a worldly perspective and a temporal kind of situation? You know, uh, when we think of Job, right? Job was blessed abundantly more after he came through his storm. And he didn't understand what it was all about. But the Lord blessed him. The Lord used it. His dependence upon God, no doubt, was no greater after he came through the storm. But you know, after he came through the storm, no scars. No victim mentality because of his past. He was able to overcome. And God is going to allow us to overcome. It's amazing. We don't look like we do during the storm. Most of you know that a couple of weeks ago, my mother broke her hip. And uh, I know, I know the question, why didn't we find out earlier? Well, it was, it was supposed to be a secret. We were sworn under secrecy, guarantee you. Uh, the children and the grandchildren didn't know until she was already there, so just, just saying. But it's interesting how mom is recovering from that and how the doctors are amazed at how healthy she is and how she's recovering from the broken hip. And, uh, you know, she doesn't look anything like she did when she was in the hospital. You know, God has taken a bad situation and brought her through that situation. Uh, situation. And from a physical standpoint, she doesn't look like she's broken a hip at all. Interesting. How God does that proverbially parabolically, with our spiritual lives. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, remember what was said about them when they were, were put in the fiery furnace uh, under the regime of Nebuchadnezzar when they refused to bow down uh, the idols? They were thrown into the fire. And when they got out of the fire after that challenging situation when they obeyed God rather than man, and the Bible says that there was not a hair on their body that was singed. You couldn't tell that they'd even been in the fire. They didn't smell like smoke at all. Why is that? Because God's plan is to allow the challenge, but when we go through, we don't smell like smoke anymore. There's not a scar on us. Sometimes we think they're emotional scars, but that's because we want to find a reason why. We want to try to get on the level of God and know all those particulars. And why do we think that if we know those particulars, we're going to be better off? No, the better perspective, the godly perspective is, trust me through anything, I will bring you through. And on the other side, no one's going to be able to tell that you had a bad childhood. No one's going to be able to tell all the trials and uh, perhaps you uh, have won the victory over an addiction. You know, you might suffer some of the scars of that, but God's going to bring you through and you're not going to have to live as if you had any addiction at all. Sometimes there are scars. But you know what? No one's going to need to know about those. Your uh, declaration of the gospel will not be hampered at all. In fact, if someone does know about them, they're going to glorify God in your behalf. And so glory is brought to God no matter what. I wonder how we react, what our perspective is while we are being isolated. 
Are we sharing in the cares of the world or are we overcoming the world like our Lord did when he went through his period of isolation from the Father on the cross? And now he is King of kings and Lord of lords over his kingdom that was given to him, notice, when he went back to the Ancient of Days. The Lord takes care of his own. The children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. For centuries, two million of them came out of bondage. And you know what the Bible says about that? Not one of them was feeble. They all came out energetically. And the Bible says that the people of Egypt gave them silver and gold and clothes. And they came out on the other side looking like a million bucks. Over two million of them. Why is that? Is that of little significance? No. When God allows you to be in slavery, if you remain faithful to him during the slavery, then he brings you out on the other side as good as gold, like gold being tried or refined, right? Peter tells us, in the fire. It's all a matter of perspective, though. It's a matter of what we allow. Days of captivity end. Captivity doesn't last Ad infinitum. Ask anybody that lives under communism. Slavery doesn't last long. Some of you are like this. Some of you have been enslaved to sin. Some of you have been enslaved to different things. But you are now at liberty. The Son of God has set you at liberty. You are now free. Whom Christ sets free is free indeed. And now you are glorifying God in your life. Don't believe the lies that, uh, you know, your past is just too great. You've been through too much. It's too painful. I can't do this. What God is doing in allowing you to be tried is setting you up for glory and to give him glory. When unfair things happen, it is a part of God's plan. He wouldn't have allowed it, not necessarily caused it, but he wouldn't have allowed it if he was going to leave you or didn't think that you could make it through. But you know what? It's at the heart of all this. It's all a matter of perspective. It's what we choose to think about it. The prodigal son, it was interesting what he looked like in the pig pen. But when he came back to his father, it's amazing what his father made him look like with a ring and a robe and a crown and killed a fatted calf. What did that situation look like? Oh, but in order to experience that situation, guess what? He had to endure what the life of a prodigal endures. Perhaps you're a prodigal and you're listening to this message. Perhaps you haven't gone into the land of the prodigal yet, but perhaps you're tempted to go there and this virus and the things that are coming from it are clouding and not clearing your perspective. I hope this lesson brings it into sharp perspective. You know, in order to get to heaven, we're going to have to go through the storm in this life. You won't like what that storm looks like many times. But you'll love what it looks like, and you've never seen anything like it after you come through the storm. When we come through the storm, that reunion day is going to be great. When we come through this life, the great reunion day is going to even be greater. But you know what? It's all a matter of perspective. Have you received God's perspective on how to be saved through faith and repentance and confession and being born again in water for the remission of sins so he can wash away those sins? Some people don't have that perspective. Some people have been taught all along that that comes another way, perhaps by saying a prayer or perhaps by doing enough good works to where we can earn our way to heaven. No, that's not God's perspective at all. We've seen God's perspective. It's becoming a Christian in his way. I don't want to look like my past. I want to look like what God can do with me and to make me and mold me, as we sing, after his will. Perhaps you need to be restored. What is involved in that restoration process? It's realizing that my perspective has gone away from God's, and that I again can have this perspective of no matter what state I'm in, I can be content. 
That is what God wants. That is the true happiness that comes in this life. It comes no other way. But it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of a willing, loving heart to acknowledge God as God and that he has all the answers and I don't have all the answers. Huh. Like in this virus. You know what God is telling us from his all-knowing, omniscient perspective? I don't have to know all the answers to know generally what I need to do. Thank you for listening this morning, and I hope to be able to be with you very soon. Can't wait for that great reunion day, and I hope that's your perspective as well. Good morning, everyone. I pray that all of you are healthy, and, and I want to encourage you to pray for each other and to keep on checking on each other. It's been good to, to hear from folks on the phone, although I miss, miss seeing each of you at worship. We need to continue to, to be with each other in spirit, whether we can be with each other in reality or not quite yet. Please know that, uh, that your elders are praying for you. And if you have any needs to, to call the building or, or call any of the elders, and we will certainly do what we can to take care of those needs. We want to thank Matt for the wonderful lessons that he's been bringing to us and before we pray, I want to share some verses from the 8th chapter of Romans, beginning with verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. And then verse 26, likewise the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And then verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Then verse 31. What then shall we say to all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? In verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Then picking up at verse 37 through 39, yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Our gracious Lord, we come to you thanking you for being our God, bringing glory and honor and praise to your name. And Father, we come praying for those that uh, are suffering different ways, Father. We especially pray for those who are of our congregation who are suffering. We pray for them. We pray for their recovery, and we pray for those who are caring for them. And Father, we pray for all of those health care professionals who are caring for many, both in this community as around the world. Father, we ask you to keep them healthy, to keep them strong, to hold up their hands, Father. Father, we pray for we, we pray for this virus to leave our land, to leave this world, that we can once together, once again come together to worship. Father, it's our prayer that we not be separated anymore. And Father, we ask you to to look down upon each of us. Give us strength and courage to persevere through this, through this tribulation that we're suffering right now. And Lord, we pray that each of us will become stronger as a result of it. 
that will be more pleasing to you each and every day, that will help each other be more pleasing, that will reach out, that will comfort each other, console each other, give strength to each other. Father, we ask you to, to guide us as we continue to worship you, continue to love you as you have. Father, we, we pray for all of these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. It's our prayer that we'll soon be together again. But we want to encourage each of you to, to continue to, to go to the Bible study on, on Wednesday evening and, and study the book of Philippians with us, with all of us together, and, and be with us each Sunday through this means until we can be together again. It's our prayer that that will soon, soon happen. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.